on Test Gear Teardown today we have an absolute classic. This is uh, a Hewlett Packard 3310A function generator. Now Hewlett Packard, HP, um, well known company, their first product was a signal generator, an oscillator, the Model 200. Very simple, um, quite um, rudimentary circuit, valve based. Um, this of course is all transistor. I don't think there are any integrated circuits in there, um, but it, fun it functions much the same as the early HP product. It can do slightly more than the original HP oscillator because it not only produces sine waves, it's set to sine at the moment here, it can also produce square waves, pulses, and over here we can produce triangle waves and, and ramp waves. Um, but that's basically what it does. It produces an electronic signal, a sine wave, or a triangle wave, or whatever you have selected. You can choose the frequency with the frequency control, and you can choose the amplitude with the output level control. It's turned down at the moment. The frequency has got quite a wide range. The range settings here, you have to multiply the number on the dial by the, the range. So this is set to 30, but we're in times 10 range, so that means we're at 300 hertz. It'll go all the way down. This would give you 30 hertz, 3 hertz, 0.3 hertz. goes way down from there to the low frequency end of things. And it goes up as well. It goes up to a very high range. So this 100k times 30, that's 3 megahertz. This thing can do, at the high end, 3, uh, three megahertz. So it's not really an audio oscillator or signal generator. It can actually reach the low end of the radio range as well. Um, and it can go well below the audio range. So quite a versatile instrument in terms of frequency range. Um, you may be wondering, what does it sound like? Well, I've got a little amplifier here. This is a little capsule speaker that I found in a charity shop. Um, <clears throat> fairly straightforward USB charger thing. Different generation from the oscillator, of course, from the, from the, the instrument. And here we have a connector. I'm going to put it in the low level output because that's plenty of amplitude and if I turn it up we can hear the output. I'm not going to make this very loud but I'll just bring it a little bit closer. So that is the 300 Hertz uh, sine wave. If I change it to triangle it sounds different. It's got more harmonics in. The ramp uh, waveforms, they also sound somewhat different. Now the interesting one, if I go back to sign, if I select square, that sounds quite a bit louder because it's got more harmonics in. Um, now these are all practical things to, to, to use for testing amplifiers, for testing um, filters, frequency response of things for at the low frequency end of things. You could even drive servo mechanisms with it. You could you could drive, say, a um, motorized uh, mechanical servo mechanism and you could set the frequency low and the servo would go through its uh, range of travel driven by the oscillator. These are all potential applications for this thing. Um, let's turn that back up again and just fiddle with the frequency setting. You can see the amplitude there just makes the audio louder. This will make the frequency change. Now the speaker in the little capsule thing doesn't really want to do very much at the low frequencies, so we won't be able to hear the low end. But there's 500 hertz. Now middle C is around 250, 260 hertz around here. The A above that for tuning your orchestra to the international concert pitch A is there. That's 440 hertz, the um, standard A above middle C. Um, let's just change range and hear it do that as well. And 
back to 500 hertz. Um, that's about all it can do. Uh, there's a DC offset control here, so you can say positive or negative DC offset and select how much you want. You want me to hear that, of course. Uh, it's got an input here for marked VCO input for modulating the frequency. So the input to this thing, the voltage control oscillator input there, you can uh, modulate the frequency that it produces from an external source. Now that's useful if you want to uh, sweep the frequency. You'd need two oscillators. You'd need one to make the sweep input and one to produce the audio. But you can use it for sweep oscillator uh, functions that way. There's a one here marked sync output. So that's a square wave output that synchronizes with the uh, sine or triangle so you can trigger your oscilloscope and we've got low and high level outputs uh, 30 dB attenuator between the two of those. I was using the low there because the amplifier is quite sensitive. Um, so that's the controls of the thing. There's a little fine um, geared mechanically fine control here. Um, this is fairly coarse and uh, this thing lets you adjust more more carefully with your um, a smaller knob and some sort of gearing arrangement here. Uh, power off switch here and a power neon, not an LED but a neon here. Um, so that's what the thing looks like from the outside but this is all about tearing it down so let's get a look in the inside. Um, now I have to admit that at this occasion I cheated slightly and I have taken the screws out beforehand but I'll just unplug the mains at the back before I do anything silly. Uh, I've got the mains plugged in there. Right, that's safe now. So we, can, we can cheat somewhat and remove the cover without messing about at all. Go. Oh, without messing about, there it goes. So there's the inside of it. Let's have a proper look at that. What have we got in here? Lots of discrete transistors, lots of discrete through hole components, transistors, resistors, all the things you'd expect to find in here are uh, on a printed circuit board. Now the thing is, these printed circuit boards, even the power supply printed circuit board, which I think is this one over here on the left, they're all gold plated all over. It looks like we've got several PCBs in here. And we've got this green thing as an edge connector, so there's a connector in there between the one PCB and the next. Turn this round a bit and we can see the inside of the front panel. There it is. So we've got the range switch and we've got the function switch. So this one here is the range switch for the different frequency ranges. And this one is the mode switch for what type of waveform you want to get. You can just see down there, that's the pot which is on the back of the main frequency control knob. Maybe I should zoom in a bit on that if I can. There we go. There it is. That's the main frequency control and you can see the wires attached to that and the gold terminals. A lot of gold in this thing. Look at that looped printed circuit track. Just there, there's a loop around those two inner three, two or three inner terminals. That's a guard ring. That's a PCB guard ring. So it's all gold plated. It's not got solder mask over it. I don't think there's solder mask on the board at all in fact. Um, the idea of that is that the green wire in the middle is connecting to a high impedance node that capacitor and that transistor, whatever it is, and the green wire is a high impedance connection. And so to avoid uh, current leaking across the surface of the PCB, which you'd think would be an insulator, but HP reckoned, well, maybe there's a leakage path there. So they put a, a, a ring of, of uh, conductive track around it. And the idea is that that ring is maintained at the same voltage as the terminals inside or very nearly the same voltage so any leakage has got really uh, no um, voltage drop to to, to, to uh, make, make it draw current. Uh, the whole thing is protected against leakage currents 
on the surface of the board. And that gives you some idea of attention to detail that something like this has got. Not only is it all gold plated, it's also very carefully designed and made with precision components. It looks like we have got some integrated circuits there. I, I think I was wrong in saying that there weren't any. That's a CA741. That's a familiar number, but an unfamiliar package. The round metal can there is a 741 integrated circuit, the op amp, in a round metal can. Nowadays it would be in a, a plastic can. Some plastic transistors down here. Some gold diodes. What else do we have? These are the power supply diodes, rectifiers, but again the board's gold plated. HP logo on the side there. What else can we see? Now I've taken the sides off this thing, but there really isn't to see. That's the back of the printed circuit board on the side. And on the other side we've got, I think, much of the same. Um, just a board with some, some wires going on. It's, it, it, it's got some wires. It's not got cable lacing. It's got cable ties. Um, let's have a look at the back of the thing. And not, I don't think much to see there. Mains inlet, some stickers. Use the correct fuse. Mm, very important. Um, and one of the things that I did notice looking at this, we've got not only labelled test points on there, a little sticker there saying made in Federal Republic of Germany. So this gives us an idea of when it was made, the Federal Republic of Germany, before German reunification. That's test point 10, some transistors there with heat sinks on. Let's flip it over. Oh, there's the underside. What have we got under here? Aha! We have got some interesting components. We have got two big, heavy, stud-mounted diodes. And we've got two transistors in sockets. And the transistor is actually underneath this black section, which is a clip. And that clip is bolted to the chassis. And then there's wires going to the board. This is a heatsink. They're using the chassis as a heatsink. I think that yellow stuff is insulation, not quite sure there. Um, the black clip then fits over the silver transistor and the brown is a plastic moulding with the socket in there plugged onto the transistor's leads. So the idea is that you, if you blow one of these then you can at least unplug it and replace it. These are the output transistors that produce the output signal. So this is the, the fairly low impedance output amplifier. Not the sort of thing you'd call a power amplifier these days, but at least it has a, a reasonable amount of, of go in it. And I believe these two are protection diodes. So if you were so foolish as to attempt to send DC power back on, back in up the input, sorry, uh, 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 into the output, um, these diodes will protect the circuit. And they're big diodes so that you can put a fair amount of current in there and the diode's going to win. round. What else can we see under here? That's the back of the uh, front panel with the connections, all of the little wire connections here going to the front panel. That mechanical thing there is the back of the uh, geared down um, frequency knob. So when you turn the, the geared down knob it's pressed against the back of the dial by that spring. Another HP logo there, all in gold plating. We've got some more power transistors. Now these may be the power transistors for the power supply regulator. I'd have to check the schematic for that to see what they really are. TIP42, whatever that is. A uh, little Texas Instruments part. How have we got any date codes on this? Well, that's a good question. Can we see a date code? Looks like 79. This one here, 7934. And on this capacitor, we've got 7909. So I'm going with 1979. 
uh, quite early in 1979 there. Uh, again, made in the Federal Republic of Germany. Um, at the back, we've got the mains transformer. This is an old fashioned 50 hertz iron cord transformer. No switch modes here. Oh dear, look at this. We've got a reefer. This brownish component here, if I can just get a bit uh, closer to that. Can I get any closer to that? Will it get into focus on that reefer capacitor? 0 0.022 microfarad. Now that is what one can also refer to as a delayed action smoke bomb. That is the type of capacitor that very, very commonly fails and lets out lots and lots of smoke. It's across the mains, directly across the mains. Um, it's slightly cracked and that is a bad sign. Um, the, the way these things fail is that they uh, let a little bit of damp in through those cracks in the plastic that affects the insulation and the capacitor smokes. It's designed to smoke that way. It, it's designed to fail uh, at least reasonably um, benignly um, and letting out loads of smoke is regarded as benign. Um, so that might need to be changed at some point. If you see these capacitors in instruments and they look cracked, best to change them. Um, so I think we've seen about all we can see on this gadget for today. You could take it to bits even more and you can unplug the um, the boards can be un unplugged from the from the case. Um, that would mean doing a fair amount of dismantling that I think for today I will not be doing. But um, if you had to replace a component on here you'd unplug the PCBs. So there we have it. That's the teardown of the Hewlett-Packard 3310A function generator. Uh, a fine bit of kit. Uh, lovely to see all that gold plating in there. A um, little bit of a worry to see the, the reefer capacitor. Might have to look at that. I think there's a couple more of them under there. Um, modern class X or class Y capacitors are good replacements for those. Always use a, a good quality replacement. There are other capacitors. Now these are 1979 capacitors and some people would say, oh, you want to replace those. They're actually working all right. So I think I'm going to leave those where they are. Um, there's no signs of any problems in here. The thing works nicely. Um, so I'm not going to go and replace stuff just for the hell of it. But Mm, it's something to look out for. Um, keep an eye on your capacitors. Let's just bring that round to the front panel again. There it is. Very fine. I probably need to take this to pieces and clean these in the ultralight cleaner. Um, there are Allen key uh, grub screws that you can use to, to, to take these off. So yes, there we go. Um, that's it for this Test equipment teardown. Um, this is the HP 3310A function generator.